Yeah, ben, thank you for this invitation. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, I will be giving this talk in English, but if you have any questions that you would like to pose afterwards in Spanish, I would be happy to respond uh, in Spanish as well. Uh, so the title of my talk is Towards a Phenomenology of Digital Life. Uh, and by way of introduction, I would like to just reminisce a little bit about the winter of 2008 when I first started working out a philosophical approach to plant life. And at that time, I didn't really suspect that the topic would prove to be as controversial as it did, nor that this line of thought would lead me in so many further directions for investigation. Uh, first, the controversy then. A uh, year and a half ago, I penned an op-ed titled if, if Peas Can Talk, Should We Eat Them? for the Stone Philosophy section of the New York Times. And uh, to, to be honest, the title was not really mine. It was inserted there by the editor of the New York Times to, to make the piece more juicy, and uh, they succeeded in, in that because some people have read only the title and then reacted very violently to it. In the following weeks, my argument was attacked by everyone from Christian fundamentalists to vegans and from neuroscientists to humanist rationalists. Since then, I have responded to some of the criticisms in another Times piece, Is Plant Liberation on the Menu, given numerous interviews and participated in a debate on plant ethics with animal rights advocate Professor Gary Francioni of uh, Rutgers University. Despite the occasionally heated polemics, I take the interest in this topic to be a, an encouraging sign that the current attitudes toward plants may be starting to shift. The sheer fact that they can become the subject of an intense discussion and debate implies that plants do not have to be forever confined to the inconspicuous backgrounds of our everyday lives. It seems, however, that all this is but the tip of an iceberg now emerging from the stagnant waters of humanist <coughs> ethics. Even a cursory consultation with the findings of contemporary botany is enough to gauge how they are rapidly dismantling what we thought we knew about plants. Not only can some plants defend themselves by releasing volatile chemicals that attract the predators of the very insects who feed on them, but they can also differentiate between members of the same species and strangers, altering their root growth in response to the identity of the neighboring plant. And these are just a couple of examples from a huge uh, uh, body of work in plant sciences and uh, a field, an emerging field of plant intelligence studies that uh, we're just uh, uh, starting to discover at this point. But at the moment, I would say, our political and ethical thinking about vegetation is lagging behind these discoveries in the hard sciences. Most people <laughs> consider plants to be bordering on machines, completely determined by external factors. And nothing is more conducive to the deepening global environmental crisis than the complacent and unproblematized equation of trees with raw materials available for human consumption. In last year's debate, for example, Professor Francioni compared the plant to an inanimate thing, a bell triggered from the outside. Clearly, if one adheres to an ethical pro program inspired by 19th century utilitarianism, one would want to convey a 19th century idea of what is plant as opposed to an animal. Right? The desire of vegans to enforce the old conceptual dividing lines between sentience and non-sentience prompts them to blur the obvious distinctions between living plants and inanimate things. Although they can be chemically manipulated into blossoming or delayed in the process of ripening, plants and their parts, flowers, fruit, etc., are living beings whose hormonal, biochemical, and cellular processes remain to this day largely unknown to us. And many of the plant scientists I've talked to told me that what we know is roughly about 1% of how plants actually work. Uh, so uh, uh, that's why I think it's such, such an exciting area also, because there are, there are still many unknowns and uh, many blanks to fill in. Overlooking this complexity, on the other hand, results in a thinking that is simplistic. Worse still, it gives a carte blanche to the forces of agro-capitalism bent on commodifying every aspect of human and non-human lives. Now, to redress the injustices I have just alluded to, we should try to experience both plants and ourselves differently. We should not be afraid of experimenting and giving a workout to our philosophical imaginations while searching for the parameters within which our encounter with vegetal life may finally come to pass. <coughs> and so the title of my recent book, Plant Thinking, alludes to a formula for such an encounter. I can circulate it if you'd like to take a look. But I'm, not, uh, I'm just going to mention this very briefly. I'm not going to talk uh, about this book 
all that much. Uh, it, it is available, it is out there. Uh, today's talk is based in uh, uh, new uh, investigations that have followed up in this initial project. So for me, this hyphenated term, plant thinking, means simultaneously four things. It has four uh, different senses built into it. First, the non-cognitive, non-ideational, and non-imagistic mode of thinking proper to the plants, what I like to call thinking without the head. Second, human thinking about plants. Third, how human thinking is to some extent dehumanized and rendered plant-like when it's altered by its encounter with the vegetal world. And finally, fourth, an ongoing symbiotic relation between this transfigured thinking that goes on in us and the existence of plants. A sound philosophy of vegetal life, I argued in this book, must rely on the combination of these four senses of plant thinking so as not to dominate and in dominating distort the target of its investigations. The chances of aggregating the abuse of plants by theorizing their existence are minimized, provided that the theorists themselves expose their thinking to the logic of vegetal life and learn from it to the point where the, their thinking is ready to melt into this logic, with which admittedly it will never be identical. So today I would like to offer you small samplings of the first and second senses of plant thinking, the thinking of the plants themselves and a historical example of human thinking about plants. With regard to the non-ideational mode of thinking proper to plants, I will talk about what I call phytophenomenology, the phenomenology of plant life, which is one of the surprising directions uh, my research has followed uh, most recently. I will especially focus on the phenomenology of attention in the sphere of vegetal existence. When it comes to human thinking about plants, the second sense of plant thinking, I will offer you a semi-forgotten view of the soul found in the writings of Avicenna, who deserves a much more rigorous treatment than the one he has received in the West thus far. So uh, time permitting will cover these, these two areas. As I have mentioned in my opening <coughs> remarks, recent, recent advances in plant microbiology and plant intelligence studies require an integrated conceptual methodological framework for the interpretation of new findings concerning plant behavior and communication. It is not enough either to broaden the general definition of intelligence in an attempt to account for the phenotypic plasticity of non-animal organisms, or, on the other hand, to draw analogies between animal and plant behaviors. It might be good to do that, but this is not enough. In the first case, computational, ecological, and evolutionary models of intelligence fail to account for the specificities of plant behavior considered as a mere example of information processing, organism plus environment unit, or adaptability, respectively. In the second case, if plant behavior is acknowledged as such, comparisons are prone to accusations of being metaphoric, and that this has happened many times, uh, uh, because the basis of any behavior is assumed to lie exclusively in animal conduct, right? So we think that animal behave, animals behave and plants simply vegetate, they are simply there. Uh, this is not really so, and if we, if we continue to take the animal as a model for what it means to live, uh, then we run the risk of uh, thinking of plants as sort of lesser animals, less sophisticated animals, and, and, and so on. An alternative approach, proposed by Warwick and supported by uh, Anthony Trevovas, calls for judging intelligent behavior in non-human organisms based on the models of existence and capacities of the organism in question. When it comes to plant, it would be crucial to consider uh, five broad areas of behavior that I think amount to what I call phytophenomenology, the phenomenology of plant life. First, the very meaning of being sessile and being in a place. What does it mean to be in a place if you are rooted in it, as opposed to an animal who moves uh, uh, among different places? Second, the concepts of sentience and attention. What does it mean to pay attention to the environment? Third, how above ground and underground environments appear to plants. Fourth, the significance of modular development for our understanding of intelligence. And fifth, the concept of communication within and between plants and plant tissues. What emerges as a result is, to paraphrase Ivan Thompson, a picture of an embodied mind in plant life. So let me just take up the first and the second senses uh, or features of this life, the meaning of being sessile and being in a place, 
and uh, plan, what they call planned attention. All too often, cecility has been mistaken for the plant's immobility and impassiveness, with the notable exception of rapid movements observed in Mimosa pudica or Dianea miscupula, uh, which are, of course, the uh, uh, sentient plant uh, and, um, uh, and, and uh, the Venus flytrap, colloquially uh, so-called. Uh, this is a quintessentially modern prejudice, that plants are immobile uh, uh, because they are rooted in a place. Uh, and it results from the exclusive identification of movement with locomotion, right? If we think of movement as locomotion, as a change of place, then plants, of course, are immobile. Uh, and if we, we, we only need to glance at the text by Aristotle to realize that this is not the case. Aristotle, to his credit, recognized that the latter, locomotion, is only one of four types of movement. The other three being growth, decay, and change of state or metamorphosis. Of course, the other three types of movement are also present in plant life. It's evident that the fixedness of plants in an uh, is an impressionistic mistake, given their lateral and vertical extensions, both above and below ground, ground level. Although they appear to be anchored in a place, plants incessantly explore their environments, maximizing their exposure to sunlight, avoiding or growing toward the roots of their neighbors, and monitoring and responding to changing environmental conditions. So their movements occur in a different time scale, on a different time scale than the one our consciousness can register, but they do move uh, in all of these intentional ways. Right? The plants being in a place is far from a passive inclusion in a locale. The places occupied by organisms are not objectively fixed. They are inhabited, differentiated, and constructed <laughs> in the course of organismic life and development. Directional gravity sensing and gravitropism allows the plant to discern the difference between what is up and what is down. So they do have the sense of above and below that is uh, so important, for instance, for, for our mapping of, of, uh, of space as a lived place. And this introduces the first orientational differentiation into environmental space, imposing a meaningful grid onto it and transforming it into a place or a habitat. As phenomenology shows, lived space is relative to the bodily orientation of the subject, which is at the uh, degree zero of its milieu. The contours of place change as the plant grows, extends its reach both vertically and laterally, and releases volatile airborne and below ground biochemical signals. Its sense of place depends, therefore, on the non random, deliberate placement of new leaves and shoots and uh, uh, branching out of roots. In other words, the place dynamically emerges from the plant's living interpretation of and interaction with its environment. Right? So the sense of a place for a plant is objectively, can be objectively uh, discerned in the way it places uh, its new uh, shoots, roots, leaves, and, and growths. Right? Only when sicility is taken to be synonymous with passivity does it point toward the general conclusion that plants live in a state of torpor. The conclusion buttressed by the fact that plant cells are enclosed within the walls of rigid cellulose, unlike animal, plants, uh, animal cells. Right? From this, uh, Henri Bergson extrapolates that plants are characterized by, in his words, consciousness asleep and by insensitivity, though he immediately moderates <coughs> this claim to his credit by considering plant, in, plant insensitivity to be nothing more than a reversible tendency, hinting at the possibility of plant behavior. So plant, uh, ha plants have a tendency to, uh, uh, to uh, go into torpor, to a consciousness that is asleep, a tendency that does not preclude those exceptional mov moments when they do wake up. Right? And animals also have a tendency toward a uh, kind of wakefulness, which also does not preclude a plant-like torpor, according to the song. Right? Still, the dynamic nature of plant growth and adaptation requires plant cells that are inherently excitable and sensory. Right? Th these are the, the conclusions of, of contemporary plant microbiologists, such as uh, Frantisik Balushka of, uh, uh, of Bonn University in Germany. Even if cells do not circulate in the bodies of plants as they do in animal bodies, they generate action potentials and synthesize the protein RHD3, responsible for the proper arrangement of root cell files underlying the direction of root growth. 
right? So uh, from this uh, uh, presumed torpor of uh, cell enclosed and cellulose uh, membrane, uh, uh, plant still manages to, to get a solution uh, uh, to, to extend itself, uh, its roots for instance, by synthesizing these proteins and generating action potentials. It is this directionality of growth along with its deliberate regulation that will hold the cue to the intentionality inherent in plant life. And I use this term intentionality in the phenomenological sense, which I will uh, briefly qualify now. At the origins of phenomenology, intentionality was conceived already in the works of Edmund Husserl as the consciousness of, or in strikingly spatial terms, as directedness toward, so phenomenological intentionality is uh, uh, shockingly extensional, right? Directedness toward, it's already a kind of spatial term. To be conscious is to intend something, that is to say to be directed toward the intended object. And of course the metaphysical notion that uh, in, uh, phenomenological intentionality supplants is the will, right? In light of this definition, the intentionality of plants may be understood as the movement of growth directed toward the optimal patches of nutrient-rich soil and sources of light. And already Hegel was, was also aware of this feature of plant behavior. He cited potatoes sprouting in the cellar and wondered at how the sprouts, in his words, climb up the wall as if they knew the way in order to reach the opening where they could enjoy the light. In his philosophy of nature, he gives this example of what I would call clearly uh, plant intentionality. When animals intend something, they enact their directedness toward by moving their muscles, right? So hence, animal behavior is this enactment of intentionality through the movement of, of, of muscles. When plants intend something, their intentionality is expressed in modular growth and phenotypic plasticity. They change states right, and grow. This is, this is the model of animal behavior. But both plant and animal behaviors are the accomplishments of the goal set in their respective intentional comportments, taking into account the different positions uh, in their lived environment. One sessile, the other mobile. Of course, there are sessile animals as well. Uh, and, and their kind of phenomenology we would expect would be closer to that of plants. The chief cause behind the illusion of plant immobility is the difference in the time scales of human and plant lives, something I have just mentioned a few moments ago. In everyday settings, it is impossible to perceive the growth of plants since many plant responses may take days or even weeks. Right? We cannot simply stare at the plant and observe it, be, it, it, it behaving, right? simply because of the time scale of the response. From the phenomenological point, uh, point of view, not only the sense of place, but also that of time is indexed to the subject who experiences it. In contrast to the objective clock time, Husserl, who stood at the origins of phenomenology as we know, put emphasis on internal time consciousness or on how subjects experience the passage of time as either fast or slow, depending, for instance, on their mood at any given moment. So uh, the duration of this talk can appear to you like an eternity if you're very bored, or it might fly in an instant if you find this fascinating. Right? This, is, this is just to exemplify uh, internal time consciousness. It's likely that such variations in temporal perspectives are not only interpersonal, but also extend to cross-species and even cross-kingdoms uh, differences. If phenomenology of plant intelligence is relative to the capacities of plants, then these two must be relative to the specific temporal framework wherein these capacities are enacted. One area where there is a partial overlap between the internal time consciousness of animals and plants is time estimation with the help of circadian clocks. Right. Besides the fact that the same molecular mechanisms permit plants and animals to exploit circadian clocks, leave the leaves of some plants, such as uh, Lavatera critica can anticipate the direction of sunrise even after they have been prevented from solar tracking for several days. Right? The combination of memory and anticipation is consistent with the phenomenological description of time as the retention of a past now moment and the projection into a future now moment by a conscious subject. The <coughs> sense of place remains incomplete without this, its experiential temporal dimension. So plant intelligence then entails at the most basic level the subjective constitution of lived space and time by the plants themselves. This is what 
I very broadly understand by plant intelligence. The subjective, from the phenomenological point of view, the subjective constitution of lived space and time by the plants themselves. Plant behavior is marked by a successful, from the practical or pragmatic point of view, orientation in local environment, taking into account minute changes in temperature, humidity, gradients, and so forth. And plants are able to juggle up to 15 environmental factors at the same time, along with all their combinations. So if you combine those 15 factors, and in all the different combinations, you can see the, you can start to get a sense of the complexities of plant intelligence, right? One of the reasons behind the success is that plants grow not so much in opposition to as in contiguity with the ecological niche that they inhabit, as evidenced by the maximization of their surface exposure, right? Animals tend to, to minimize their surface and to hide, right? They, they try to survive by, by being able to hide and to sort of protect themselves in, in that sense. Plants survive by maximizing their surface exposure, right? Uh, a rooted mode of being and thinking is then characterized by extreme attention to the place and context of growth, enhanced by sensitivity, which at times exceeds that of animals. So this is, this is a, a, a conclusion that one reaches just by examining the data from, from the botanists and plant scientists that sometimes, at, at certain uh, instances, at, in certain examples, the sensitivity of plants exceeds that of animals, Exactly because they are so exposed to the outside world, they are so in tune with the environment that they do not separate themselves from, that they uh, constantly monitor it on all of these different levels. <coughs> now, studies of plant intelligence, however, have tended to concentrate on memory as the benchmark of intelligent behavior. And this is really a hot potato <coughs> issue in uh, plant intelligence studies. Uh, this is a group of, uh, of botanists from all kinds of countries that uh, are sometimes embattled by their more traditionally minded colleagues, right? Uh, who think that uh, something like plant intelligence is uh, complete nonsense. Uh, and, and so there have been lots of conceptual battles on defining what, me, what, what is meant by plant intelligence. And one of the benchmarks that was set was uh, behavior uh, uh, based on memory. Memory is a kind of benchmark of intelligent behavior. Now, although memory has a bearing on all three modalities of time, including a remembered past event, the present of storage, and the possibility of future retrieval, it is a marker of intelligence heavily biased toward the past. Right? On the other hand, attention, and here we're, we're moving to the second feature of, uh, of plant phenomenology, attention is a feature of intelligent conduct in the present whereby an organism selectively responds to ever-shifting stimuli in a way that allows it to maintain adequate levels of adaptation to its environment, right? So, uh, since plants cannot really uh, hide anywhere, they cannot run away from danger, they have to be extremely, uh, uh, exquisitely attentive to the outside world and the changes around it, right? The plant does not move from one place to another uh, uh, and, 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 and sort of shift in that way. But it, the world around it shifts and changes all the time and it has to be able to track those changes uh, uh, to the best extent possible, right? Before processing, evaluating, and communicating information, plants must first attend to or take note of the bits that are relevant to their optimal growth and development. But how should we understand attention from a philosophical point of view? I mean, uh, clearly psychologists and uh, cognitive scientists have their own take on attention, but I'm a big proponent of the specificity of philosophy and the specific contribution that philosophy can make, even when it comes to these, uh, let's say, traditionally psychological or cognitive uh, elements. <coughs> attention in general is not, I would argue, reducible to mental concentration, to the mental concentration that usually distinguishes this at attitude in human beings. A cross-species, cross-kingdoms definition of attention that I propose entails, and this is what, uh, my definition, a disproportionate investment of physical or mental energy by an organism, tissue, or cell into a particular activity or into a reception of a single doubt stimulus or set of stimuli. So, attention, that, uh, the definition that should apply to all species and kingdoms is a disproportionate investment of energy, what in psychoanalysis is known as cathexis, right, to, uh, to cathect energy uh, uh, to, uh, to an object, uh, an energy that can be physical or mental by an organism, tissue, or even a single cell, 
uh, in, uh, uh, this investment into a particular activity or into a reception of a single doubt stimulus or set of stimuli. Still falling short of a non-anthropocentric theory of attention, uh, von Exkul, who has been uh, extremely uh, important for many 20th century phenomenologists, from Martin Heidegger to Maurice uh, Malopunti, <coughs> described how a relevant stimulus is noticed, die in German, by an animal subject, such that a portion of its environment is transformed into a perception sign, Merksi-Zeichen. In the course of this noticing, which stands for the most basic stratum of attention, of, Merksam, uh, of Merksamkeit, right in German, which shares the German grammatical root with noticing, the world is imbued with significance for the particular life form in question. So to attend at this most basic level is to notice, to mark, uh, 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 right, to transform a piece of the environment into what he calls perception sign. Philosophically speaking, whatever is so noticed corresponds to the non-indifference of the cell or organism whose survival often depends on registering the perception signs appropriate to it and vital to its survival. Right? So uh, if we cross a street, a street, a busy uh, intersection, our attention is going to, uh, to be a disproportionate investment of mental energy into uh, tracking moving cars, right? because that's so crucial to our survival. Uh, in the case of, of plants, their attention is going to be directed toward other uh, elements <laughs> of the environment that uh, may or may not promote or endanger their survival, shifting temperatures, predators, and so on and so forth. Of course, we're uh, fighting here centuries and millennia of philosophical uh, uh, bias and prejudice in the West, because for Western philosophers, plants are indifferent and insensate beings. The vegetative intake of nutrients and exposure to sunlight are taken to be symbolic of a passive mode of living that does not pursue any objectives whatsoever. Right? So attention as an active mental and physical attitude does not really factor into this kind of general state of things that has characterized Western thought for uh, a long time now. Contrary to this bias, studies of plant foraging behavior have revealed highly selective adaptational responses to patchily distributed subsoil resources. Right? So uh, root growth is not haphazard, it is not undifferentiated. Uh, clonal plants, for instance, selectively allocate offspring ramets to the preferential patches of soil in the presence of multi-patch environmental heterogeneity. So when, uh, when soils, uh, uh, when presented with heterogeneous soil environments, some rich in minerals uh, uh, some patches are rich in minerals and others aren't, then more uh, uh, ramets, more of these clonal offsprings are going to be placed in the uh, uh, resource-rich uh, soil patches. In environments with homogeneous resource distribution, the presence of competition also solicited a stronger root proliferation response and conferred a selective advantage to plants proliferating in the direction of the most recently acquired patch. Right. So even when soils, the soil environments were uh, homogeneous, when there was uh, competition from another plant detected nearby, uh, uh, root uh, responses, root growth responses were uh, uh, different, were not, again, uh, were, were selective, were not uh, homogeneous. Morphological plasticity in foraging behavior explains the different patterns of spacer production and therefore different patterns in the placement of these resource acquiring structures. Now, as these examples demonstrate, foraging behaviors in plants are highly selective. And uh, uh, along with those foraging behaviors, we have to include, of course, uh, uh, the exposure of, uh, uh, of a plant to sunlight, maximization of exposure. So plants do not only forage with roots, but also with their leaves. <coughs> these behaviors are accompanied by attention to numerous environmental factors, foremost among them resource availability and the presence or absence of comp competitors in the environment. Moreover, they help illustrate the general phenomenological theory of attention, usually restricted to human consciousness. According to this theory, just to give you uh, the, the, the take on, on uh, phenomenological attention in a nutshell, the act of paying attention depends upon three interrelated and dynamically structured elements. First, focus or thematization. So we have to focus or zero in on something, on the stimulus. Second, context. Right, the context in which this focus is placed. 
and uh, in which it can shift as well to other foci. And third, margins or horizons. So the limits of this, uh, of this context uh, that are also shifting. The first element, focus, is a selective zeroing in on a significant stim stimulus or set of stimuli. In the case of foraging, a stimulus plants focus on is the quality of the soil, which must be assessed as a precondition for selecting a resource reach, patch. But in order to attend to an appropriate stimulus, the attentive subject must first single it out from a general field or context that surrounds it. So if this context, the second element of the theory of attention, is a kind of undifferentiated white noise, the background, then a relevant stimulus has to stand out, has to be singled out from, uh, from this uh, field and become a focus of attention. If the stimulus is not significant for the subject, it will remain dissolved in the context, which ought to be understood as the background white noise, as I have just mentioned. Growth in homogeneous environments in the absence of competition resulted, of course, in random rooting of ramets in plants like Lemus chinesis. Right? And, and so uh, here, uh, there was really no focus of attention. The whole context remained undifferentiated, and that's why uh, ramet placement uh, 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 the, the routing of ramens was uh, random, was not concentrated in any <coughs> single spot. Under these conditions, neither of the species, Lemus chinensis or uh, Herocloid glabra, neither of these two species focused on any given patch of the soil. While information about resource density is still potentially useful, it's relegated to the context of attention and is not brought into the focus of the attending organism. Whereas a single-minded or unifocal attentive comportment is said to absorb the attentive subject. Let's say we're reading a very a fascinating book. It absorbs all of our attention, right? So it becomes this exclusive focus of attention. We can also think of involuntary attention, which is dispersed throughout the sentient body, right? So even when we explicitly focus on a given object, we are at the same time involuntarily attending to a multitude of factors in our environment. Uh, on the margins of our consciousness, right, in a sense. And this involuntary attention is not only conscious, but dispersed throughout the sentient body. Multifocal attention is similarly characteristic of the green plants that register blue and red, far red light in the apical meristems cells, as well as in leaf phytochromes, respectively. Plant signaling, therefore, involves communication from a focus of attention to other tissues not directly affected by the stimulus. So not only do plants focus on a given stimulus, such as uh, certain uh, kinds of light, but they, they then communicate what they, the information they received at the focal point of attention to other uh, uh, tissues not directly affected by the stimulus. <coughs> and they're also capable of coordinating among multiple attentive foci each of them singling out a vital piece of information about environmental conditions, often by way of parallel processing, as in the case of leaf photosensitivity. So plant scientists tend to think about uh, uh, this modular growth of plants where the same structures are reiterated time and again, right? This is the sense of modularity as a kind of parallel processing where, uh, when uh, the same sort of information is uh, received through, uh, 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 through reiterated plant structures. Attention then individuates whatever falls within its focus or foci by bringing the stimulus into sharper relief against the blurry background of the relatively undifferentiated context experienced as white noise. So uh, uh, the, the object of attention, what we pay attention to, does not pre-exist the act of paying attention. What I'm saying is that uh, in humans, as well as in animals and plants, there is a kind of singling out of a stimulus, and th this singling out individuates the object, creates the object in the first place by foregrounding it from the undifferentiated context uh, uh, of, of our existence. For humans, this individuation, or phenomenologically speaking, thematization, yields the objects of experience along with the conscious directedness, intentionality toward these objects. Consciousness and its acts do not pre-exist the attentive attitude, but are co-originary with this attitude, right? This is the, I think, the crucial point of phenomenology, that attention has the same sort of scope, the same thematic scope <laughs> as intentionality, which is to say, as uh, the same scope as consciousness itself. 
There are no objects of attention or of consciousness before they are singled out in this attentional or intentional uh, manner. Attentionality and intentionality share the same functional and structural scope in phenomenology. Now, while it plays the role of putting into focus and thereby singularizing crucial environmental inputs, the attention of plants is objectless, right? So this is the limit uh, to, uh, to the parallels we can construct between animal-human behavior on the one hand and plant behavior on the other. Uh, plants do not experience these uh, things that fall into the focus of their attention as objects. Their unique sight, the sight of the plants themselves, does not translate visual stimuli into pictures, but into instructions for growth or reproduction. So it's immediately active, it's not contemplative in that sense. Plant attention is likewise active rather than con contemplative, as it feeds directly into the plant's phenotypic plasticity and capacity for adaptation. To individuate the foci of attention, it is not necessary to transform them into objects. That's, that's to say, forms that are cruder still, still than the discernments and discriminations of which plants are capable. Not only do plants distinguish between mechanical and herbivore-induced damage, but they also respond by releasing appropriate airborne volatile chemicals or communicate through below ground stress cues indexed to the specific stress factor. Right? The more dire threat, the more does the need arise for an attentive singling out of its source with a view to its mitigation or to altering a rel relevant facet of plant morphology and physiology so as to reduce the impact of the stressor. Right? Plant behavior is the cumulative outcome of its attentive focusing on varied events in its environment. So plants do not have to somehow uh, uh, attentively focus on something and then create a representation of what they have registered and then act upon it the way animals or humans do. Plant behavior is already a cumulative objective outcome of the plant's objective focusing on varied events in its environment because it is immediately transcribed into uh, uh, biochemical and even, gen even genetic instructions uh, appropriate to the response. Given the variability of environmental circumstances, it's unreasonable to maintain a constant focus on a single stimulus or group of stimuli. So, uh, as attentive subjects, we cannot forever zero in on one object only. We have, uh, our focus has to shift, right? Simply because environmental conditions also <laughs> shift. Attention implies as much fixity as movement or change, keeping the attentive organism attuned to the variations in the surroundings. In other words, Attention motivates a chain of focusing, defocusing, refocusing, right? So it's not just a choosing a single focus. We have to focus, then defocus, and refocus again in keeping with the needs of the attentive subject in any given time or, as in the case of non-sessile organisms, place. In the tripartite scheme of attention, these modulations, these changes, are expressed in the interchangeability of the present focus and other previously insignificant points in the context where it's situated. Let me give you an example of, of this kind of modulation of attention in plants. Before the onset of abiotically induced stress, such as drought conditions, plants perceive cues emitted by their already damaged na na neighbors. So even if plants, certain plants do not experience uh, uh, drought conditions directly, they can perceive cues uh, from their uh, already damaged neighbors who have experienced uh, 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 drought. In plant-plant communication, the foci of attention can therefore overlap, even if the contexts from which they stand out are different, namely actual drought conditions in the one case and proximity to a stressed plant in the other. Due to the identical focus, the response to a communicated cue will also be the same as to the onset of drought. So even those plants that were not directly exposed to drought conditions, when they receive these cues from their already damaged neighbors, have uh, modified their behavior as if they were experiencing drought. Right? So that's what I mean by the overlap in the focus of attention, even if the context is not the same. Uh, since plant attention is active rather than merely contemplative, as I have mentioned, its stress-related modulation results in behavioral changes that often entail the activation of stress-inducible genes, RD, responsive to dehydration, ERD, early responsive to dehydration, 
COR, cold regulated, and KIN, cold inducible, in Arabidopsis, and extensive transcriptional reprogramming. So uh, all of this chain of, uh, of um, uh, stress and this genes that are being activated happened even in plants that were not directly exposed to drought conditions, but have, that have received uh, biochemically emitted cues from the roots of the neighboring plants that were exposed to drought conditions. Right? The open-ended morphology of a plant objectively expresses its acts of, acts of attention over time, and I'm repeating the point I mentioned earlier, as its body plan is adjusted to environmental conditions, for instance, through hormonal control of, uh, of shoot branching. The decision on activating a particular auxiliary meristem is taken at the intersection of local information processing, the information received by a given uh, uh, shoot, and the global network of hormonal signaling attuned at the same time to the external environmental factors and the plant's internal physiological and developmental needs. The interplay between these various levels of attention in plants is thus no less complex than in animals and humans who also permanently shift between attention to external objects and to their internal mental or physical states. So this is just a very uh, sort of crude outline of what, what I mean by phytophenomenology, uh, the plant's sense of place and a kind of plant attention that we can start thinking about. Uh, and now uh, I would like to uh, move on to the, uh, so as not to abuse your, your own attention, to the final part of the talk where I very briefly introduce some of the ideas from uh, a medieval philosopher Avicenna uh, who I think has been uh, unjustly ignored in the West thus far. I have briefly cited Hegel as one of the precursors, albeit problematic, to plant thinking. Of course, the relevant philosophical tradition reaches much further back than this, through Spinoza and Leibniz back to Plotinus and ultimately Aristotle, with his notion of uh, the vegetative soul. Belonging in this list, Avicenna, which is the Latinized version of the 10th century AD scholar Ibn Sina, is not likely to elicit any strong associations. Nonetheless, it is this philosopher that may prove to be the vital link between the ancient and the modern philosophies of plant life. Now, uh, uh, first, I, I would like to think with you about what Avicenna means by nature, what, what he really means by nature. And the poverty of nature in his thought is astonishing, especially compared to uh, the ancient Greek conceptions of uses of nature. Although he tends to refer to the vegetal soul, to the soul of plants, and its traces in us as well, as the natural faculty, in his understanding, nature is still more deficient than the plant that exhibits the first and the shakiest union of matter and psychic form. So Avicenna in many ways remains Aristotelian. He still thinks in terms of entelechies, right? In terms of the uh, formed matter uh, that, that creates an ensouled being. And uh, plants are the first examples of the first union of, uh, uh, of, of a soul and matter, right? And the, the first and the shakiest, the closest to the inorganic mineral world, not only in their own existence, but conceptually as well. And so they, they are, plants already for him are deficient, but nature is even more deficient than that. Taken in isolation, nature is impotent, in his words, unable to originate a soul body in one stroke, and in want of a power by which she can fabricate a living body by the promotion of growth." End quote. To generate anything, nature requires the assistance of divine providence, which is the unquestioned source of the soul, from the simplest vegetal to the most complex human varieties. We might say that Avicenna anticipates the modern reductive view of nature as a conjunction of mathematizable and mechanically di driven processes. To be sure, in contrast to modern naturalism, his mechanized nature is made tolerable by the deus ex machina of the soul, right, and of divine providence. But subtract the soulful supplement from his philosophy, and you will end up with a world uncannily resembling a Newtonian universe of efficient causes and effects. So this is what nature means, this nature without the soul and without uh, divine providence. This is what nature means for Avicenna. And, as we said, the plant for him is the most natural being, so it's the closest to this deficient conception. So what belongs within the realm of nature properly so-called, according to him? In addition to the <laughs> classical elements, the four classical elements of uh, water, fire, earth, and air, Avicenna includes under this heading four forces. And the four forces of nature are the attracting, the holding, the digesting, and the excreting, or repelling. 
intimately related to the nourishing, growing, and reproductive faculties of plant soul, which are already evident in Aristotle's work, the four forces of nature are inferior to these self-organizing capacities. So the uniqueness of plants is that they are able to, uh, uh, to have a certain level of self-organization, albeit uh, a deficient one, right? In, in uh, what Avicenna calls nature, such self-organization is, is lacking. All we have are these forces, uh, mechanical forces of attraction, holding, digestion, and excretion or repulsion. Uh, uh, the inferiority of these forces allows plant soul to establish its tenuous mastery over nature. Vegetal life is, as Avicenna has it, subserved by the forces of nature. So the forces of nature are, uh, are uh, the servants of plant life. The relations of vassalage and mastery binding together the living plant and the inorganic world give us an accurate snapshot of the socioeconomic relations in the time of Avicenna. That's why Avicenna uh, not only inherits the Aristotelian notion of, of, of the soul uh, in this tripartite division between the vegetal soul, the animal soul, and, and the human rational soul, but, uh, and, and that notion is in and of itself already hierarchical, but Avicenna uh, creates an even more elaborate hierarchy out of it, uh, building in these relations of vassalage and mastery in already into each part of this uh, scheme of Aristotle. Whereas the plant may be the feudal lord over the elements, it is still reduced to the serf of the animal and the human. What is more, since its soul does not subsist as a simple unity, it, its different faculties enter into relations of mastery and subservience amongst themselves. And so we have here a kind of hierarchical political economy of plant soul, which lies at the core of Avicenna's Aristotelianism with a twist. Now, with recourse to elementary logical deduction, we may conclude that when Avicenna defines vegetal soul as natural, tabiat in his terms, he obliquely ascribes to it the deficiency of nature and an unstable form of life verging on death. The plant's proximity to the mechanical forces of nature is especially evident in the nourishing part of its soul <coughs> that strings together the attracting, the holding, the digesting, and the excreting. The nutritive faculty for him is the lowest faculty of plant soul. Gazia is the uh, nutritive faculty, the lowest faculty of, of the plant soul, and in his words, is that whereby the elements are transformed into the, like, the likeness of the thing nourished, thereby replacing the loss incidental to the process of life. In order to transform the nourishing other, for the plant sunlight, water, minerals, etc., into the nourished same, this faculty must engage directly with the four forces of nature, adding to them the practical notions of difference and identity. And so Avicenna stresses, um, uh, uh, Avicenna stresses that Gazia, this uh, nutritive faculty of the soul, is not to be confused with the digestive power in its service, precisely because the nutritive faculty is above and beyond mere digestion and introduces relations that are no longer only physical but crudely spiritual, the relations of difference and identity that are absent from nature have to be found only in a living organism that is self-organizing according to him. Right? At the same time, this faculty is comprehended as the lowest stratum of the lowest kind of soul as a result of its near immersion in the realm of nature. Actively mastering the attracting, the holding, the digesting, and the excreting, the nutritive faculty passively submits to the augmentative faculty of growth, namia. So we have within the plant soul this emerging hierarchy where the nutritive faculty is the lowest and it has to submit to the faculty of growth, the augmentative faculty. And here I think um, I'm going to, uh, to cut to the chase. What is interesting is that for Avicenna, the, the faculty of growth uh, is the first thing that happens contra natura, that moves against nature, and therefore can be only explained in spiritual terms. Uh, it uh, uh, already betrays the existence of a soul that drives the ensouled body away from its physical element, as does, in his words, a flying bird's motion with its heavy body high up through the sky. So just as the bird defies the force of gravity, the natural force, in flying up, so the plant in growing up, emerging from the darkness of the soil, uh, uh, um, moves out of the purely natural element to a kind of spiritual realm. Growth for Avicenna is akin to the avian flight in that it also destines a relatively heavy body of the plant pertaining at once to the earth and to water to the airy expenses above. The augmentative faculty, as I mentioned, operates contra natura, 
which is why it earns the standing above its nutritive counterpart. Right? So, uh, this faculty of augmentation stands higher in the ladder of the vegetal soul for yet another reason. It sets its eyes, its sight on perfection. Growth entails an increase in the body's dimension in the right proportion. So in nature properly so-called, there is no perfection for Avicenna. Uh, things are more or less random. And only when you have this, these ensouled bodies can you get something like perfection <coughs> because things grow in the right proportion. And growth that is measured and balanced would permit the plant to achieve perfection in Avicenna's terms. Uh, that's another reason why this augmentative faculty is ranked higher than the nutritive one. But there is still another faculty of plant soul that is even higher than that, and that's the generative faculty, Mawalida in, in Avicenna's terms, that houses a spark of divine creative form bestowing force. And I quote, the reproductive faculty gives the matter the form of the thing, unquote. Rather than replace the loss incidental to the process of life within an organism, it substitutes the whole organism, the whole creature, with another like it. While the nutritive faculty transforms difference, nourishment, into sameness, the nourished, and while the faculty of growth augments the same bodily dimension in the right proportion, this uh, uh, reproductive or generative faculty articulates sameness and difference in a more complex constellation. Right? And uh, we, we get the sense of, of that complexity uh, very easily. Now, uh, just uh, to, um, to conclude, uh, Avicenna, of course, uh, is still not completely impressed by all of these things that plants uh, exhibit. He still calls them insensate uh, living organisms, living organisms that are insensitive, and uh, it seems to be a bit of a... Uh, uh, an oxymoron to say that because life already entails a certain degree of sensitivity to, to the environment, right? Uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, th there, is, um, uh, th there, there is this uh, caveat to it. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Avicenna, this is the point I want to conclude with, Avicenna uh, shows us exactly how uh, something of the plant soul survives in us human beings because he doesn't, doesn't think that these faculties are limited to the plants themselves. Of course, we can also obtain nourishment, uh, our bodily extension can grow, and we can reproduce and so on. But uh, Avicenna thinks that uh, what we have in the realms of thinking and perception are nothing but correlates to the vegetal faculties, right? And this I find fascinating, really. In the canon, in his uh, uh, in the canon of medicine, his magisterial work, Avicenna likens the natural forces organized by the nutritive faculty, as well as the augmentative and generative faculties, to mental processes in humans. So he says that the force of attraction is equivalent to perception, retention is memory, transformative power refers to cognition, and the force of expulsion corresponds to expression. The augmentative faculty, the faculty of growth is translatable into the acquisition of knowledge in human beings, and the generative faculty is tied to inventiveness and creativity. And this is, I would say, Avicenna's plan thinking in a nutshell. Well in advance of Spinoza's ethics, physical processes and the tendencies of the lowest kind of soul are interpreted as modes of thinking completely under the sway of matter, unfiltered through the purifying form of abstract thought. So that our abstract thoughts, what we think of our abstract modes of thinking, are nothing but sublimations and transformations of these concrete material uh, forces of nature and uh, uh, aspects of, of the plant soul. By absorbing uh, and retaining water and solar radiation, the plant perceives and remembers the liquid and sunlight. By growing, it acquires the knowledge of its environment, exploring the locale's most beneficial resource rich niches. By reproducing, it invents itself each time anew. It invents its genus. And vice versa, uh, we might say by, by extension, humans think by way of eating, drinking, ex and expelling the byproducts of nourishing substances, by growing and having children, though the more rarefied forms of thought are available to them as well. 
Avicenna is certainly not alone among the philosophers in attaching a negative value judgment to these material modes of thinking, right? For, for Spinoza, whom I have mentioned just a moment ago, uh, uh, the, um, the materiality of thought is emotion, which is unclarified thinking, right? So thinking has to be, emotions have to be purified to turn into clear and distinct perceptions, into thoughts. So uh, there is a kind of negative value judgment attached to these material modes of thinking, but we would be amiss if we were to disregard Avicenna's emphasis on medicine with its concern for adjusting the material conditions of life, being, and thought, so as to promote healing and individual well-being. In the markedly Plutinian language, we might say that Avicenna's medical corpus is the place where abstract thinking cares for its material corollary or where the rational soul worries about the vegetal soul within a human. Right? So we have here all kinds of mixes already between the different senses of plant thinking that I have mentioned in the beginning of the talk. It's not that page after page in the canon, the mind tries to cure and control the body. The body is not just the object of the mind to be manipulated. In this magisterial, albeit often flawed book, human thinking endeavors to optimize the plant within us. Right? And this is, this is the next sense of plant thinking that I, I'm very keen to, to explore to optimize the plant within us, these vegetal capacities that continue to survive in us both directly as the capacities for uh, obtaining nourishment, growth, and reproduction, and indirectly in this transformed form I have mentioned. But this already leads us to the third aspect of plant thinking, and so outside the scope of my presentation. I thank you for your attention. I hope I did not abuse it. <coughs> and I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. Um, well, thank you very much. I think uh, it's 